Uh, my name is Yasuhiro Inami, and it's an honor to be in this MC conference stage uh, talking to you guys. And uh, in staying in Warsaw is a wonderful experience in my life so far. And I would like to thank Polydia team for inviting me and organizing this great event. And today, I would like to talk about one rare but new topic called Elm architecture in Swift. Though some of you may not be familiar with this topic, uh, I hope everyone here will enjoy it. By the way, I can, uh, it, I'm working at the company called Abema TV. It's uh, located in Tokyo, and we develop a lot of media and uh, entertainment apps, including this live TV show app. If you're interested, please uh, talk to me at any time. And so let's get started. So first, let's talk about architecture, the one we are really <laughs> love to talk about. But before diving into today's Elm's topic, Let's talk about some of the existing architecture we're already familiar with. The first one is MVC. Well, as we all know, it stands for Model View Controller. As a diagram, this shows, it shows a clear separation of model and view. And controller sits in the middle to coordinate these two. And this is very starting point of all other architectures. But here, this is the best. And it's always an annoying question. It's a whole reward, and I'm afraid to answer that question. <laughs> but in this presentation, I would like to point out one issue that's common in many of these architectures. A view control is just a view. And then these views will hold the, the layer called presenter or view model with some UI logic inside. And next presenter will own the use case, or we also call interactor in Viper which will own the uh, business logic. And these will hold the repository, data source, entity, and so on, the data layer. And in clean architecture and Viper, there's also a layer called presenter that takes the whole applications like navigation stuff on the topmost uh, wireframe or router. So in short, we can summarize like this. We can say that app will own the view, and view will own the model. One more time, view will own the model. This also means view always comes first and model comes secondary. And here, please imagine what will happen if the view gets deallocated for some reason. Of course, our model, precious model, will also get deallocated too. And what will happen if another view wants to refer to the same model? Well, boom, of course it crashes. Well, we don't see this kind of <laughs> problem nowadays. I mean, not nowadays, pro before than that, that. Because ARC, for example, can manage the memory management for us. But still, we have to do a lot of work to do like that, uh, like this code. So can you see this code? Uh, this is a one way to avoid the model to be deallocated too quickly. It's to share the model across multiple views to keep its lifetime longer. As you can see the code here, view retains the same model that is passed from initializer. This is pattern is just the same as dependency injection with the constructor injection pattern. But here, we notice that we are writing a lot of boilerplate code, like red model and like long initializer and signature. This will soon become a problem because uh, if there are uh, many more models to share, we need to pass them around each manually every time. And if we are using interface builder, like storyboard, zips, the problem gets even worse. Because the instantiation from resource files is now required. We can't inject the model at initialization time anymore. So what we do, we you need to use a center injection instead. And having a center means we have mutating things many times. And we can make mutate as many times as we want. But that's not really the feature we want. We want more immutability to the view. So in both cases, whether you are using interface builder or not, owners and injections that take place everywhere and sharing the model is what we always do, but it's quite not easy solution. Let's try thinking of other possibilities. If we go for more easy solution, 
maybe a singleton, maybe an alternative. <laughs> and singleton allows us not to write a boilerplate code anymore. And it works really nice with Interface Builder too. But as we all know, there's a pitfall. Using a singleton model <laughs> will lead to a tight coupling with the view, and there's no longer a separation of layers anymore. So 99% of the time using a singleton is a bad practice. Let's go back to previous arrow once again. View owns the model. Here we also have another problem. That is, in our app, we have tons of views to display on the screen, right? That means we also have tons of models like this as well. And in MVVM or any advanced architectures, they normally have one-to-one -one correspondence using two-way data bindings, but each model is still isolated from each other by default. So what do we do? to make our app LAN is to interact, let them interact with each other. So for example, this is kind of uh, weird writing, but this means model one is like calling the web API and the response will go to model two and model two will take that response, save to the database, for example, and response will go to model three and model three will take that response and also like fetch some uh, data from model four, combine them together, do some calculation and sent to the model 5 and so on. Well, this kind of data binding, each model manually every time, is still hard work, even when we are using reactive programming. Please imagine if you are having a thousand interactive views and models in one screen, and you have to just keep writing the data flows like this. Your code will become full of data bindings, and well, it looks again like a spaghetti code it's like reactive spaghetti and i would say yeah and which is better than normal spaghetti but it's still spaghetti so can we solve this problem and the answer is yes we can but how let's think different let's think the arrow this one was something wrong why view owns the model how about changing the idea, the second arrow like this? Now, view no longer owns the model, but the app owns it instead. Actually, if you just take a look at this closely, this is nothing different from the original MVC pattern. Model and view are nicely separated. Ownership is the same. The only difference is just a name. So we can just name it in different ways, like app coordinator, mediator, interactor, and etc. But the most important thing here is model and view should be owned by the one sitting in the middle. So let's go back to the original MVC once again. <coughs> let's not access to the view model like this anymore. And instead, let's access the model inside the app. And let's create the view from apps model. What's nice about this approach is, unlike the previous architectures, <coughs> model comes first and view comes secondary. In other words, model is a true source of describing everything, including the UI. And if you have ever done a web development before, React is a framework that lets you dive into this new world. In case you have not uh, used this framework before, uh, it's React is a JavaScript framework that uses the view rendering engine called uh, Virtual DOM, and it creates updates and uh, DOM, the real DOM from given model. This model to view mapping works like a functional approach, and React is probably one of the most successful web frameworks in recent years. If you remember the old days of web development, this is how we did before React. App owns the real DOM tree and modifies it directly through like using a tool like jQuery to mutate the states. It's very fragile way, easy to make mistakes, bugs. But when React came out in 2013, the virtual DOM starts to sit in the middle and it's called React component. And instead of app modifying the real DOM directory, now the app modifies the React component instead. By the way, I'm going to talk about virtual DOM later in this uh, presentation. Let's move on to how React delivers the event throughout the system. This is the diagram of React component hierarchy. 
As we can see, the components are conforming, uh, constructing the trees like UI kit views, and each component actually having a state. But when using React, uh, it's a good idea to always let the topmost uh, node only own the state, and other less uh, state rest. So that when its topmost state just changes, the whole uh, tree just changes. I mean, only the partial part will change it uh, with an uh, efficient virtual DOM algorithm. And here's what happens if you, uh, the child component, for example, receives the user event. The first and the bottom most component receives an uh, event we call action. And that action will be propagated to the topmost node. And then topmost node will call its uh, state change called set state. And the whole uh, tree will uh, do an incremental update. But in this process, uh, relaying events from bottom top is quite cumbersome uh, process. And we normally do is using a companion framework like Redux. Redux is one of the famous Flux architecture that has unidirectional data flow and a singleton state container, like this diagram. Let me explain what's going on here. So uh, first, we have a Redux container on the light, which receives the actions and manages the whole application state. By doing so, the state is completely removed away from React, so that the React whole component will become more testable and reusable. Once the action is sent to the store, it will pass through middleware and reducer, which will create side effects and as well as the state changes. And a new state is set inside, and that state will be delivered to the re topmost React component. And React component, I mean top one, will just do the increment update, and the rest of the views will just update. To summarize this, <laughs> React is a, a framework that renders the view using the efficient virtual DOM algorithm, and React uh, Redux is the singleton state container with action, uh, reducer, and middleware that defines the application's business logic. This architecture is really fits to the functional way, and I think this is really a breakthrough architecture. And nowadays, React is not only for web development anymore. React runs in our native app code, too, <laughs> such as Facebook's React Native, and recently, Microsoft also released a React XP on top of it uh, with a TypeScript version. It is really surprising to see these web frameworks, web technologies are impacting our native app nowadays. I really feel the strong momentum to it. But please wait. There's more I can talk about this architecture. It's not only React that has a breakthrough architecture, but also there's a hidden gem you might not know yet. And that is Elm, today's topic. Have you ever heard of this before? Okay. Well, let me explain what it is. Elm is a functional programming language uh, focused on the web development, and it has a very syntax, very like a Haskell syntax, with the it transcompiles to the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it's one of AutoJS. Elm is purely functional with the static typing and uh, strict type evaluation. And for new learners, Elm is one of the easiest language to learn because it doesn't have any abstract types like uh, Swift protocol uh, type class or higher kind of type stuff, which is too difficult to learn <laughs> sometimes. And it doesn't even require functional reactive programming knowledge. In Elm, it used to have, but not now. And internally, Elm uses the virtual DOM technology and also the effect manager. I will talk about this later as an inside core. And these two, you create the unidirectional flow, like Flux Redux, which is well known as Elm architecture. This is a simple diagram of Elm architecture. The Elm runtime here bottom, it sits in the bottom and it maintains the whole application state and event dispatch cycles. And uh, it will send the, uh, when the event is comes out, it will dispatch the message to the update function. This is the where the state changes takes place. And after the state changes, it will generate the HTML. In this case, it's the virtual DOM. And both state and the virtual DOM will go back to the Elm runtime, renders the real DOM, and sits and waits for the next event to come. So the keywords here are the model, the state of our whole application, 
the view is a virtual DOM that renders from the state. An update function, it's a way to update your state. And this is the uh, example of Elm's code. And it's with this only 14 lines of code, you can generate the UI like this uh, screencast. So you have two buttons with a number level in the middle. This is just 14 lines of code. Can you imagine? Well, let me explain what each line does. So the first one is a main entry point. It has a function calling a function called beginner program, which creates a programming uh, instance and with the argument model, view, and update as our arguments. And then we define the type message. Uh, in this case, we just want to declare two events, so increment or decrement. So it's like a in Swift's enum case. And the uh, update is the function which takes the uh, message input from outside message, and the model is the current model, and it will eventually creates a new model inside. So in this code, it's increment. if you receive the message increment, you increment the model. And if you receive the decrement, you decrement the model. And the last one is a view function. It's uh, only one argument. You take the current model, and it generates the virtual DOM, like this one. So it's like div and the but button, div button, and it's very simple UI. And as you can see, this code lo really looks like some kind of HTML template engine but it's actually a part of sy Elm syntax. And that's it. So can you imagine if you are trying to write uh, the same UI in other languages, even in Swift or and iOS? Do you think you can write a code as simple as this code? I don't think so. So from this code, I think you can now feel the simplicity and beauty of the Elm. And in fact, if we compare with React and Redux, we find a lot of Elm's advantages here too. First, Elm's virtual DOM doesn't own state at all. And it doesn't manage life cycle by themselves. That means Elm's virtual DOM is way simpler than React. And it's faster, actually. Secondly, Redux is already built in as a core system. As I just mentioned, it's an effect manager. An update function works just like the Re React uh, Redux's uh, reducer function. And the big difference is that Elm's update function can also handle the side effects too inside, even if it's still a pure function. And lastly, Elm is a typed language. And well, you don't have to do any runtime type checking, like props uh, validation, prop types validation in React. Well, in React, uh, on the other hand, we can use TypeScript or Prototype nowadays, but still, uh, Elm's type language is more powerful. So overall, Elm really looks great. And what I just thought was, can we implement the Elm code in iOS? And can we do something similar in iOS? And unfortunately, just using the Elm language inside the iOS is not supported. It's well, you can do like JavaScript bridging, <laughs> in like JavaScript web view, JavaScript core, but today let's not do that. We are, there are already some frameworks doing so. So instead, <coughs> let's just use our most favorite language, Swift. Let's make our I Elm architecture in Swift. Let's write the code something like this Swift code and make our app run. How? To do so, we need a bit of preparation to support Elm architecture in iOS. The first one is obviously the virtual DOM. Let's dig into this a bit more. So in virtual DOM like React, the model will project uh, uh, virtual DOM like the blue one. So let's say that you have an orange circles, that's the model, and you just project uh, a, a virtual DOM from it, the, like the top blue one. And if the, at some time later, the m if the part of the model changes, so like the red circle on the left, and you project again the second virtual DOM, then the bottom blue circle will be created. And if we compare the two blue circles, top and bottom, we see that the change set is the red rectangle here. And you just extract that red rectangle and apply to the real, real uh, view tree. And uh, we just apply it, and only the minimum amount of update will take place. So in a nutshell, virtual DOM is all about diff and patch algorithm. In iOS, however, 
there's not so many frameworks doing so, especially in written in Swift. So here I wrote a new framework for this dog called Beachery. It's a virtual DOM for UI kit. You can find the code at GitHub. Beachery is inspired by JavaScript framework uh, called Matesk's virtual DOM, and it's uh, written in JavaScript. And this patch, um, it's what this diff and patch function uh, can be written as uh, these types, function types like this one, diff takes the old tree and new tree, and it will create the patch object first. And then uh, use that patch object and apply it to the existing view. And it may sometimes change the view, so it will return the optional view and so on. And it, it will do the F efficient calculation and increment update for you. And this is the very ex uh, quick example of how to use B-tree. And we first we prepare the model, it's which is a zero integer in this case. and we call the function render to create a virtual tree and then create the real view from it using the function call a create view. And after that, and we let's say we are using timer to increment the model one by one. And as you can see, we are calling the render function again. This is creating the virtual DOM again. But this time, we don't call a create view anymore because we want to reuse the view. We don't want to create every time. It's very expensive cost. So we instead call a diff function and apply function to update the uh, view. And well, this a bit looks like too much calculation on the f first glance, but uh, you can run this one in background thread and with uh, you below the one frame, 60 milliseconds, normally. So it's no problem for the performance. <coughs> and this is an uh, overview of protocol B3. Uh, it looks a lot of uh, properties here. Uh, the important part is the props, which is the dictionary representation of the V-tree attributes to make the patch object. This can be generated from uh, using like a reflection, Swift's dynamic feature, and uh, you can also set the real view, like using KVC. There are many more things to discuss here, but for now, I will only pick uh, Flexbox here. Flexbox, if you have never heard of this before, it's a CSS framework, uh, Flexbox layout engine that is used in B3 layout uh, instead of using like iOS auto layout system or like US stack view. And there's already a C implementation by Facebook called Yoga, and which is a cross-platform cross library and also used in React Native actually. And the library is original, uh, this uh, my library is a wrapper and it's actually original f originally from Josh Barr's uh, Swiftbox implementation. And what's good about uh, this library compared to the other one is that layout calculation can be done in background threads, so you don't have to block UI threads. And this is it for virtual DOM part. Let's talk about the second requirement, and that's state machine. We also call it the automaton. So what is state machine? Well, it just looks like this diagram. So let's say you are the first in a state S1, and if you receive the A input A from outside, the state will transit to S2. And if you receive input A again, the state doesn't just go back to the state 2 again, S2 again. And if you receive the input 3, a C, and state will change to the S4, and so on. That's it. An impractical application, including Elm, state machine is often used to manage the application state. And it will handle the input from outside, and it calls the state function, state transition function, and it also changes the state as well as generating side effects sometimes. And this kind of state machine is so-called Miri machine, <coughs> which is first invented in George by George Miri in 1955. And this is actually a, really a prototype of Redux. And <coughs> Miri machine can be expressed as a six tuple like this one, and I will explain each. Uh, so you, it's a Greek symbol, it looks like weird, but uh, it's just very simple. So you ha just need to prepare set of inputs as a sigma, set of outputs and uh, omega, and set of states as a large S, and you ex uh, there's also an initial state, so it belongs to large S, which is called S0. And delta is the state transition function. This means uh, you receive the current, you, you are in a current state and you receive the input, and it will generate a new uh, state. And last one is a lambda, lambda output function. It also has the same argument. So you, 
with the current state and uh, new input comes out, comes in, and you output the something. So that's that's it. And you just need to prepare six of them, and you can make a MIRI machine. And if we look at the Elm's program function carefully, especially the update function, we find that its type signature is almost the same as MIRI machine. So delta with and lambda symbols together. That is, the state transition function has uh, input and current state as an argument. It will generate both state and output. To make MIRI machines in Swift, one quick way is to just reuse reactive programming, such as reactive Swift and RX Swift. And here are the libraries I implemented called reactive automaton and RX automaton. So please check them out. For this talk, I will use uh, reactive Swift version. And there are also related videos I talked in last year in Japan and Singapore. So if you really like reactive programming, this is probably the one of the fun talk too, so please check it out. And let me briefly show you uh, how reactive automaton works. And well, this is a simple diagram of uh, login flow. You have four states, and there are actually five inputs in total. And the naive way to create a state transition function is just keep using switch cases and all over the place like this. And well, it's very readable. And we can do it better, actually. And in the active automaton, I used the Swift custom operator, like the vertical uh, one line. And it looks like clearly a markdown table view like uh, syntax. And compared to tons of switch cases, it's much easier to read now. And this is one of the main features of our reactive automaton. So please check this out. And with the reactive programming support, you can do a type safe, type safety, after my thread safety, and the event handling support for free. And if we combine this B tree and automaton together, we can create the Elm architecture in Swift code. I just named this one Elm Swift Elm. So uh, I think I have time maybe, but I don't want to fail my demo. So I just took my recorded <laughs> demo. So I let you show this one. So this is the playground, uh, Xcode playground. And you have the code on the left and the UI on the right. It's very similar to the plus minus button with a number label in the middle. And can you see the, yeah, there's a return function, has a root view and level and two buttons in it. That's it. So it's actually the top. There are many more codes, but actually it's almost a layout code. So you can just move it to like style sheet uh, function if you want. But I didn't just do it. So the main code is just only the like six codes here. And well, if you, if you run this one, and you can just press press the plus button and increment the number. And if you press my uh, press minus button, you can decrement the number. And also, you, if you tweak the attributes like corner radius, and the screen will get updated with corner radius. Yeah, of course, you can keep doing the event uh, cycle. And this is the interesting part. If you du duplicate the level, and this is actually your level, and it, sorry, the uh, playground is, is quite slow. So, <laughs> and, uh, so, so you can now, if you just press plus button, both levels get incremented. And if you press minus button, both levels get decremented. And this is the example of you duplicate the buttons too. N now this time, it takes a bit some time. See, you can just see the two buttons forward now, and you can press either button to increment either both levels. Yeah. So without doing any reactive binding stuff, you can just uh, do <laughs> binding for free. Yeah, and that's, that's the power of virtual DOM, I think. And the second example here is the gesture function. And yeah, the same, it's very simple code. And you, if you drag the screen, uh, the red green circle uh, square is like displayed. And if you tap it, the orange circle square is displayed. And this is just uh, you can, uh, playing around. And if there's a slider, you can like go back to history like this one. So it's kind of time traveling. This is the one power of the virtual DOM and like React and Elm, uh, because if you store the state, each state, 
and you can just go back to that state and just display the uh, view, and you can just do the time traveling easily. So that's very, very powerful. And this is the Swift Elm, and it looks, yeah, it looks like, work, um, like magic, but uh, actually I have to tell you that there are some tricks I used in this framework. And the first trick is I used meta programming actually. A template meta programming, which I used sorcery as its in, uh, engine. Uh, so maybe most of you in here know about sorcery because Christoph, Christoph Zabowski. Yeah, I'm not sure he's here, but no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to briefly introduce about these frameworks, uh, sorcery is a code generator that uh, generates. Uh, code uh, using a source kitten as a Swift uh, ASD parser and stencil template as a rendering engine. And you can automatically like, generate like equatable lenses, uh, many other stuff. And in Swift Elm, this is required because uh, you, we want to extract the user defined enums, uh, event messages, which are mainly functions, but we want to call evaluate it from uh, El Swift Elm runtime. And Swift runtime is already compiled, you know, before we define the message function. So uh, we need to kind of do the evaluation stuff. And one more trick, which is actually very dangerous, is the extracting of function pointer slow address from memory to allow function comparison. As you can see, the uh, unsafe bit cast here. Uh, this cooperation is very <laughs> dangerous, actually. And to understand its underlying mechanism, we need to learn about Swift's LBM IR gen layer, such as Swift function that has 16 byte pointer in size, called thick function. And function point there's function law pointer as well as the context pointer. And you need to compare both of them. But it will be kind of automatically wrapped by like called the, ac the abstraction sunk. And you have to take care of that. Uh, using uh, like a punk box slapper to avoid the sunk. So anyway, uh, it's kind of very difficult thing, and I have to warn you that Swift ABI is not uh, stable yet, and so uh, it may change in future versions. So uh, I w just want to warn you that please never use this in production code. It's just an example. <laughs> so if you're interested in uh, Elms or React like architecture, there's also another live uh, framework I built. And it's called Zerkova, <coughs> a safe version of uh, kind of virtual DOM. So please check this out instead. So uh, here's the summary of my talk. As we went through uh, different patterns of iOS architecture, we found a common pattern that lines there. I mean, the problem lines there. That's the layer ownership. And the new framework, such as React and Elm, has proved that Model first development is the key to the successful app development. In iOS, however, we only have UIKit and there's no virtual DOM yet, so I think, uh, and we have to make it from scratch and also state machine part. And V3 and Reactive Automaton are the libraries of those outcome. And by putting these two together and we add some hacky spices in it, we can create a fun Elm architecture in Swift. Uh, Though so this framework is not uh, production ready uh, yet or never in future, uh, I hope you get the idea of Elm architecture from this talk and hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk. Okay, so thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Are there any questions? Yeah, so as you know, I'm also really interested in this topic. Um, and we've seen a lot of similar approaches where people built this and as like a demo. Do you think there's any chance that we can collaborate and actually ship this? Or how, what is your experience? How far is this from production ready? Production, so I just used the unsafe bitcast <laughs> stuff, you know? <laughs> That's like never, never, right? Yeah, so I'm more curious about the virtual DOM part. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah virt uh, so virtual DOM part is very uh, same approach as like React and like I use the JavaScript uh, famous library, and which is very simple. And I think that the idea you can you can just use it and share uh, the idea. Yeah, but uh, there needs us if you want to do more like a Elm-like event handling, you need to like adapt the its effect management uh, system more in, uh, and you need a kind of dynamic feature. 
So I just need to like function comparison, for example. So it, uh, you, you don't have to do it if you don't want to diff, diff things. You know, you want if you want to create function every time and you just put it every time. That maybe that works and doesn't maybe affect the performance much. I don't know. I'm not quite sure, but but that's not that's if you are doing a real virtual DOM, you need to diff each of them. I think, and I think that I, I just took that approach. So Short follow-up question: mm -hmm. um, Does the virtual DOM work for collection views and table views? Actually, right? no, not okay. yet. I only made a very simple one, and you can wrap it with uh, virtual table view, for example, and let the other works do it uh, inside the UI, the UI table view. But yeah, I didn't wrap it yet. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually the very difficult part, I guess. <laughs> so, any other questions? Mm. If not, I, I, I might have one more question, okay. if I can. Um, how did you find the experience of uh, adapting the already existing Apple frameworks, like UIKit, to this new model? Because they were definitely designed with a different model in mind for a different architecture. So, mm -hmm. is it like a lot of fight? against the already existing frameworks, or is it uh, is like uh, easy to adapt them? That's a very good question, and it's very, very hard to adapt, you know. Inside the uh, V-Tree, the virtual DOM, I did a lot of hard work inside, so <laughs> maybe you can just take a look at the code, and or maybe uh, you, feel you might feel old. <laughs> but anyway, uh, making a diff, uh, I mean, patch object from uh, using, like, a, I use the KVC and, like, reflection stuff, you know. And you, you have to convert it from type safe, uh, some uh, type to like a type unsafe version because first you have to map it into dictionary. It's j what the JavaScript normally does, you know. J dictionary as a just like normal instance, right? They just compare it. So, so it just goes back to like type unsafe world. So that's kind of very. When I first tried this, I was just curious. I was kind of made this for fun, not for just production, but just for fun. So, and when I just like c copy the like virtual DOM part, I feel like oh this is not <laughs> maybe <laughs> you know, what we should do. <laughs> like, but that, that's still that's that's a kind of good experience for me to understand how virtual DOM actually works. Yeah, and so there needs a lot of work to wrap, you know, you uh, like it. And uh, j just a short follow-up uh, question because. Uh, when you said that you lacked some reflection mechanism from mm -hmm. Swift, do you think that it could be actually easier in Objective C using the Objective C uh, oh, that's right. dynamic? Yeah, Objective C using Objective C might be a better uh, approach uh, because it has more dynamic features. But mm, but but still, the hardest part is the UI kit part, and uh, yeah, that's that's I think not so much different <laughs> from Swift. Actually, if, if you write Swift, you can write the 14 lines of code more simpler, you know. In a compared to Objective C, of course. So uh, it's like some are good, some are bad, I think. Yeah. Okay, so are there any more questions? If not, thank you, uh, Yasuhiro, very much for thank you very the inspiring much. talk.